Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Corey D.B. Walker, and I am the Wake Forest Professor of the Humanities and Director of the Program in African American Studies here at Wake Forest University. On behalf of the School of Divinity and the Program in African American Studies, I welcome you to the 2021 McBrien Prophetic Speaker Series. We invite you to share your questions and comments for today's speaker by submitting them through the Mentimeter, uh, through mentmeter.com. It's right up behind me. Um, you will be able to find the access code on the screen and select questions will be featured during our question and answer session after the lecture today by Professor West. This year's event promises to be a truly special one in the history of this series with our distinguished speaker and our new president of Wake Forest University. A renowned biomedical scientist and visionary higher education leader, Dr. Susan R. Wente became Wake Forest University's 14th president on July 1st, 2021. In addition to serving as president, Dr. Wente is distinguished university professor of biology and, biomed and biochemistry. Dr. Wente has been widely praised for her bold and engaged leadership and innovative initiatives to enhance undergraduate education while elevating the arts and humanities. Throughout her time as an academic leader, Dr. Wente has maintained a commitment to groundbreaking research while personally mentoring dozens of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows in the Wente lab. Please join me and welcoming a true teacher scholar, the 14th president of Wake Forest University, Dr. Susan Wente. Well, good afternoon and thank you, Dr. Walker, for that introduction and to all of you, welcome to Wake Forest. It is really my great honor to serve as the president of this great university on, on behalf of everyone at Wake Forest to welcome you to this absolutely amazing event. I am so pleased that you've joined us for the Mac Bryan Prophetic Preaching Series. Now we often speak of the meaningful relationships between Wake Forest faculty, students, staff, and our community. And this speaker series, in so many ways, is a celebration of these special connections. In honor and memory of George McLeod Mack Bryan Sr., a professor of religion, his former students, George and Carol Williamson, created this series to perpetuate his commitment to courage, his commitment to diversity, to justice, his commitment to compassion and reconciliation. Professor Bryan joined the Wake Forest faculty in 1956 and taught here for 37 years. Think of all those that he influenced. During that time, he introduced courses on feminism, religion and science, medical ethics, and black and liberation theology. He fought tirelessly for civil rights, pursued social reform, and was instrumental in helping to integrate Wake Forest College in the 1960s. He also wrote several books on social justice. To celebrate Professor Bryan's legacy, the Williamsons created this preaching series to bring pe preachers and speakers to campus who represent the intersection of Christianity and social justice. It is my very great pleasure to be with you here today and to now invite to the stage our Dean of the Divinity School, Jonathan Lee Walton, to introduce this year's Mac Bryan Prophetic Preaching Series speaker, Dean Walton.
It's been said that those who need lengthy introductions typically don't deserve them. And those who deserve them usually don't need them. Today's speaker merits an introduction that would far exceed the allotted hour. Yet you are all here today because the name Cornell West means so much to so many. The name itself has become synonymous with philosophical genius, a signifier for progressive cultural criticism, and a symbol of prophetic Christian witness that keeps track of the most vulnerable and makes room for all who are weary and heavy laden. His name, his name symbolizes an inclusive vision of humanity that transcends race, religion, nationality, gender expression, sexuality, and any other social construct that divides, delimits, and defines human personalities. This is why you are here today. Some of you have read at least one of his 22 published books over his illustrious career at Yale, Princeton, Harvard, and now Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Some of you have witnessed his grace and his gravitas as he engages any and all from the cultural left to the conservative right, from Fox News to Democracy Now!, from Anderson Cooper to Joe Rogan. With warmth and wit, he unapologetically articulates a moral agenda that privileges the poor and excoriates the supremacist logics of empire. And others of you have witnessed his genius and expansive artistry through a range of other platforms. Maybe it's his tightrope podcast with Professor Trisha Rose his Grammy award-winning musical collaborations with the likes of Arturo O'Farro, Terrence Blanchett, Killer Mike, and even the late great Prince. Cornel West needs no introduction. Nevertheless, I must say there is a risk when one's name becomes universally recognized appellation and one's identity is seemingly ubiquitous in the 24-hour infotainment complex. One's identity is readily given to caricature. One's contributions and character are easily mischaracterized, and one's human flaws and foibles, that most common feature of humanity, becomes fodder for those who prefer ad hominem attacks over robust intellectual engagement. Yet this is what happens when you have a figure of such historical distinction and cultural acclaim. Think Frederick Douglass, Dorothy Day, Martin King, or Maya Angelou. Everyone knows of them. Most know little about them. But to truly know something about Cornel West is to know something about the communities who raised him, the people who loved him first and longest. To know Professor West is to understand the rhetorical and spiritual genius of his grandfather, the Reverend C.L. West, as well as Reverend Willie P. Cook, his childhood pastor at the Shiloh Baptist Church in Sacramento, California. When you witness the Jeremiadic and tripartite homiletic structure of his essays and his lectures, it comes from, and it's a result of these preachers, indelible imprint upon his life. To know his love of learning and his intellectual discipline and his superhuman kindness is to know his father, Clifton L. West, Jr., 
who woke up every day and knotted his tie and headed to work for the Department of Defense. It's to know his mother, the recently departed Irene B. West, whose contributions to Sacramento's educational, civic, and spiritual life led the city to name an elementary school in her honor. And to know this man is to know his greatest gift. It's neither the awards nor the accolades, but rather it's his ability to affirm, encourage, and inspire the humanity of all who have the privilege of sharing his presence. It's his keen sense of compassion, his gratuitous generosity, his towering tenderness, his salubrious sense of humor that sets him apart as a warrior of love, justice, and joy in a world too often defined by meanness and mendacity. Cornel West needs no introduction. And this is why you are here. So please receive Professor Cornell West. That's the best introduction I've ever received in my life. <laughs> I can just see mom and dad looking over the porch of heaven and say, little Ronnie, little Cornell, you haven't lived in vain. My dear brother John, man, I don't have a language to describe the depths of my love for you Cecily, where, 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 there it is, Cecily, ooh, and there's Zora, and Baldwin, and we know Elijah's spirit here, you all were my home away from my house in Cambridge. I shall never, ever forget it. Wake Forest, actually, for me, is a kind of homecoming because the high moments of my summers for many, many years was to come here at Wake Forest and be part of the governor's school. And we had these sharp, brilliant folk often feeling marginalized because they wanted to read Dostoevsky rather than do other things. And we spent six weeks. This brother named Joe, I forget his last name, he went to Harvard School of Education who invited me every year here at Wake Forest. And he gave me a chance to spend some good time with fellow Baptists. This is something you don't often experience in the Ivy League. <laughs> with all of their secular parochialism and provincialism, and I love them. I'm trying to be a Christian, love everybody. Uh, and I've had some magnificent times with my Harvard and Princeton and Yale folk, but to be able to come to Wake Forest and uh, and spend those time with the young folk, indeed, indeed. My dear sister Susan Ray Wente, straight out of Iowa, trained at Berkeley, and now visionary and courageous leader in higher education, president, 14th president of Wake Forest. Let's give it up for our sister. Indeed, indeed, I was telling my beloved wife, Anahita, I said, you know, I know Wake Forest is going to be special, but we had no idea it would be this special. Set eyes on Brother Corey D. B. Walker. I can see you right now in our reading course there at Harvard and Barker Center, always talking about both the texts as well as your magnificent wife, who was studying at MIT at that time, here at Wake Forest University. It always strikes me as quite a challenge. You know, you go back to Cartledge, 
Creek Baptist Church in 1834 and the vision they had for the Wake Forest Institute. What can we Baptists do? Now, I know it was on the vanilla side of town, but <laughs> it takes time for the love to spill over sometimes. Uh, but then when you have towering figures like my dear brother Mac Bryant, full of fire, the real thing, connected to Martin Luther King Jr. inviting the great James Cone to come down. James Cone was cast as an antichrist in Time magazine, but Mac Bryant said, I discern the Christian gospel working in his heart and mind and soul and text. Come to Wake Forest. That's Mac Ryan. Where's Brother George and Carol Williams? There you are. Give it up for these two. Give it up for these two. <laughs> building on their mentor, building on their teacher, building on their professor. I was also blessed to meet her, uh, Carol's sister and husband as well. Just wave, just wave, just wave. Give it up for them, give it up for them as well. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. And you all know tomorrow morning we're going to have quite a fascinating discussion with some of the most brilliant minds of the younger generation that have insights that I know not of. You start talking about Brandon Terry, he's got a book coming out called The Tragic Vision of the Civil Rights Movement. It's already the definitive treatment and it hasn't even hit the streets yet. That's like Marvin Gaye's going on. Everybody was talking about it before you could hear it. That's my brother Brandon Terry now, teaching at Harvard, my forever colleague at Harvard. Maisha Cherry, we just had a magnificent conversation with her book, The Case for Rage, the role of anger and how it becomes intertwined with righteous indignation and forms of compassion. It just dropped, what, about two weeks ago, I think, Sister Maisha? We were just at Harvard there just two years ago. She's now a distinguished professor at the University of California, Riverside. You see, for an old school brother like me who's been at it almost 50 years, it brings joy to my heart to know that we have grand exemplars who are trying to keep this tradition alive. Now, we got Satima, too. I think we're gonna, she's going to be piped in. Is that right? And then you all here to, to, to have my dear sister Marion. Oh, my God, my God, what a blessing. Just wave, just wave, wave. Give, give it up for our dear sister, Professor Hatton. But I salute each and every one of you. You can see I'm in no rush at all. I'm in the great Baptist tradition. <laughs> and anytime I come to North Carolina, I know I'm coming home because I'm in John Coltrane country. <laughs> Hamlet, North Carolina. High Point, North Carolina. Father dies. His grandfather, Reverend William Blair, one of the greatest black freedom fighters in gut bucket Jim Crow, North Carolina, incarcerated, parsoned by the governor. All three, father dies, grandfather dies, grandmother dies. His mother goes to Philadelphia to try to create an economic foundation. He's an only son. He got one cousin called Cousin Mary. He wrote a beautiful song for her. And he's all by himself. This is for the young brothers and sisters of all colors in the audience. And he's blowing his horn, blowing that instrument created by Adolf Sachs in Belgium in 1846, but never knew it would be so Afro-Americanized Afro by John Coltrane, connected to Charlie Park and Coleman Hawkins and Ben Webster and a host of others. But he's blowing that horn, trying to bring him back. He's all by himself, trying to finish up his high school years. That's what I've come to talk about. 
What is the relation between our vocation and our tradition as it connects to John Coltrane's love supreme? Because I come from a great people. We have produced a grand tradition of black folk who have been chronically and systemically hated Four centuries that keep dishing out love warriors, teach the world so much about what love is and what love can do. Brother Jonathan, it's so right that I stand here as a very, very small moment in a grand tradition of a great people. Because I'm a love child, thoroughgoing love child all the way down. Clifton West, Irene B. West, I will never be one third of the human being that they were. No matter how public and visible and salient I might be, I know who I am. I'm just a crack vessel trying to love my crooked neighbor with my crooked heart, as the great W.H. Auden would put it. And the calling is, how do you bequeath and transmit that kind of love? And it's a love of not just neighbor, but of truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak and to be hypersensitive to those voices because those black people I'm talking about had an anthem called lift every voice, not lift every echo. No, no extensions of an echo chamber. No, find your voice just like your fingerprint. It is unique and singular. You're going to have to wrestle with the dark corners of your own soul and come to terms with that battle that's taking place on the battlefield of your soul against the hounds of hell, against the hatred, against the greed, against the hypocrisy, against the envy, against the resentment. Yes, what kind of countervailing forces and figures and voices can be in in place against those hounds of hell. And it starts at home inside of yourself. That's what I learned at Shiloh Baptist Church with Willie P. Cook and Deacon Hinton and Sarah Ray, my vacation Bible school teacher. <laughs> we were told over and over again, again, if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. Yes. I saw my dear sister Piper Shannon. She had this spirit just overflowing, leaving a little heaven behind. But you can see it's not a function of skin pigmentation. Because I know some black thugs and gangsters. I was a gangster before I met Jesus. I'm now just a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. So when I call somebody a gangster, I think people used to come down on me for calling Brother Trump a gangster. I said that's just an objective condition that I'm highlighting. That's not a subjective expression because I've got gangster in me. He's on a human continuum with me. I felt the same thing when I saw my sick vanilla brothers in Charlottesville coming up to our faces, cussing and spitting and carrying on a brother. How come you call us brother on the time, all the time on television? I can't stand that. I said, my brother Jesus loves you too, just like he loves me. Jesus died for you too, not just me. You choose to be a gangster. Then somebody grabbed me and said, brother West, we, we already in trouble. You can got us in more trouble now. Well, I'm here to bear witness. I come from a great tradition of a great people. And in the face of the hatred, here come the love warriors, the love of truth, the love of beauty. Very important. 
Not a lot of talk about beauty these days. Everybody want to talk about justice, justice, justice. What you into? I'm into social justice. Oh, really? The great Ryan Hone neighbor used to say, any justice that's only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice. You better have more than justice in your tank. Justice is what love looks like in public. Just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. And truth and beauty are intertwined. You cannot tell the story of any people, let alone black people, without telling the story of the quest for truth and beauty. And you hear Donna Washington sing this bit of earth by Clyde Otis, that's beauty. Yeah, Aretha Franklin sang that song by a genius from Macon, Georgia, named Otis Redden, and the song is called Respect. That's beauty. When you read Toni Morrison's Beloved, beauty. And I could go on and on and on. So any serious attempt to intervene in the present moment, this present moment of overwhelming spiritual decay and moral decrepitude. That's what we're talking about. We've got to raise the banners of what the Greeks call arate, excellence, spiritual excellence, moral excellence. And what is that? As I said before, not skin pigmentation, it's spiritual formation, it's ethical cultivation. It is courageous action and it is for some of us divine connection. Be unapologetic about speaking what we feel inside as it relates to this tradition in which this particular Palestinian Jew named Jesus was crucified and the blood that flowed from his body at that cross has salvific power and emancipatory potential if you are willing to make certain kind of choices and recognize your own inadequacy and recognize your own need for a grace bigger than you so you can become a vessel to become a force for truth and a force for beauty and a force for good. Oh, what a tradition. And of course, we Christians have no monopoly on it. I don't exist without Malcolm X. He's Muslim. But of course, he had a Baptist minister as a father. So my Baptist sensibility is always looking for a connection. <laughs> I remember the first time I met Huey Newton, founded the Black Panther Party. And my first question is always, it's the question he had asked James Baldwin. Who are your people? Where you from, brother? I'm from Glen Elder. I'm from Shiloh Baptist. I'm from Irene Clifton and Clifton and Cynthia and Sharon. He said, oh, my father was Reverend Newton. Oh, I see. Pastor of Bethel Baptist Church in Monroe, Louisiana. And there was not a vanilla folk who would come close to his father because his father had no patience whatsoever, especially with the police. Reverend Newton's son, Huey Newton, Baptist Connection. <laughs> very, very interesting. We can go on, Mahalia Jackson. Reverend John Harrison Lorenzo Smith, January 1932, the beginning of a artistic renaissance in the history of the American empire, the first time that gospel voices would ever be raised in Ebenezer Baptist Church that had just broke from Olivet Baptist Church. And in six weeks, there would be a break from Ebenezer in the Pilgrim Baptist Church so that a genius named Thomas Dorsey and another genius from New Orleans named Mahalia Jackson would constitute the first gospel choir of longevity and depth with Reverend J. J.C. Austin, known as the dancing preacher, preaching every Sunday with folk lined up for four hours. 
That's the chocolate side of Chicago. That's the genius coming up from Mississippi to Chicago. Baptist. Oh, what high standards of spiritual and moral excellence we Baptists have to aspire to. We got a long way to go. We always have a long way to go. But to attempt to situate and locate ourselves in that tradition generates an over Overwhelming humility because we fall so short. We haven't even got to Martin Luther King Jr. yet, a Fannie Lou Hamer yet, a Irene B. West yet. We're talking about greatness. One of the great things about Wake Forest, I know, is that you all understand it. Greatness has nothing to do in a moral and spiritual sense with Alexander the Great. And I'll include Cyrus because my dear wife is Persian and we always like to remind ourselves of the shortcomings of our various communities. Cyrus the emperor wasn't great. Conqueror, dominator, subjugator. He was great in the eyes of the world. My dear brother Jonathan wrote a book called Lens of Love. Lens of Love. Who wants to look at the world through the lens of the cross? And that cross signifies unarmed truth, undecorated truth, unapologetic, unequivocal love. And every flag is under that cross. Every race, every gender, every sexual orientation, every territory is under that cross. And when not, we suffer from forms of idolatry. The great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel used to say, if you view life like a gold rush, you will end up worshiping the golden calf. Sonny Rollins reminds us, he said that golden rule for him is all he's ever needed growing up in Harlem. But the golden rule so easily it becomes he or she who has the gold rules. It's to triumph uh, Thrasymachus over Socrates in Plato's Republic. Might makes right. Power dictates morality. And sadly enough, in our moment of such overwhelming callousness and indifference toward the weak and the vulnerable, the great William James used to say, indifference is the one trait that makes the very angels weep. Indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself, says Rabbi and it's so true, it's so true, you see, that how do we attempt to reinvigorate, reawaken, regalvanize the best of our traditions of integrity, honesty, decency, generosity, service to others, most importantly, a quest for truth and beauty and goodness, kenosis, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -E and I know this takes us back to Brother Mac Bryan. Kenosis, empty yourself, give yourself, cut against the grain in the world, but not of the world. Not conforming, but transforming. Against the complicity. Against the cowardliness. There was a black sister named Mary Ellen Pleasant, who's known as the godmother of human rights in my state of California. 
She was a multimillionaire in the 1850s. And you think, how did a black sister gain all that money? Well, she married a robber baron, he dropped dead, and she ended up with the money. <laughs> and she gave over $600,000 to a vanilla brother named John Brown. When he was executed, that was a note he had in his pocket from her. Now, John Brown killed some innocent folk, and killing of any innocent person for me is a crime against humanity. But John Brown loved black people more than many black people love themselves. He was willing to live and die, but not justice in the abstract, but because he had a love and an awe for black people who in the midst of overwhelming adverse circumstances preserved their style and their smile and their dignity and their grace. That's what Harriet Tubman said about it. That's what Frederick Douglass said about it. And Mary Ellen Pleasant used to begin every speech. And keep in mind that it's, she's multi, multi-millionaire. And she would say, I'd rather be a corpse than a coward. I'd rather be a corpse than a coward. Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite line was always, I'd rather be dead than afraid. Marcus Garvey refused to have any demonstration without some black man or woman standing with a sign, the Negro is not afraid. The most important line in James Baldwin's letter to his nephew, you, comma, don't be afraid. Fear at its worst is another hound of hell. And if you walk around scared and intimidated, it's impossible to hold up a blood-stained banner. It's impossible to hold up a tear-soaked banner in quest for truth and beauty and goodness and the holy. God has no use for cowards. It's impossible to be washed in the blood at the foot of the cross and still be afraid. Look at that 10th chapter of Matthew three times. Don't be afraid. We live in a society now, 10 commandments pushed aside, it's the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> Just get over by any means, say anything, do anything, pose, posture, act as if you're this when you're really that. You don't say what you mean and mean what you say because you're scared. And this is especially true for black people. Especially true for black folk. Because here you get this dignified African peoples bombarded with terror every day, trauma every moment of the day. And it's only those who are unafraid and unintimidated and courageous to say, we choose to be wounded healers in the face of trauma. We, fuse, we, we choose to be freedom fighters for everybody in the name of terror. And notice black folk didn't create a black version of the Ku Klux Klan. You terrorize us, we terrorize you. No, 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 eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, end up blind and toothless. No, we're going to take a higher moral and spiritual ground. But the very means by which black folk would be pushed and rendered so scared, you could call it the N-I-G-G-E-R-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N of black people. Tell them they're less beautiful. Tell them they're less intelligent. Teach them to hate themselves. Tell them they're less moral. Keep them so afraid and scared that they laugh when it ain't funny and scratch when it don't itch and want to put on the mask just to negotiate and navigate through some mainstream and end up parading themselves to some American success. I'm an American success story and I can hear my grandmama saying, are you well adjusted to injustice? Are you well adapted to indifference? 
Are you just walking around like a peacock strutting because you're the first black X or the second black Y? Peacock strut because they can't fly. I come from a people who fly. See, L. Franklin, the eagle stirs the nest. Ralph Ellison, flying home. Song of Solomon, fly. I've taught in prison for 44 years. What is the anthem of my precious black brothers in prison? It's the Commodores, the geniuses from Tuskegee. Zoom, I want to fly away. Well, I like to fly away. Well, I like to fly away. Zoom, zoom, baby. Fly, that's the best of our people. And Brother Curtis Mayfield wrote a song for Gene Chandler called Just Be True. And the kenosis is at the core of it. See, just be true, he says. I've given you all of me and plan to give even more, baby. How you gonna give more when you just gave everything? I'm gonna work it out. <laughs> That's kenosis. Everything inside. That's Jesus on the cross, giving you everything inside. That's God in time. That's the flesh of vocation of the divine. That's the concretization of the Christian God, giving everything. And why is he up there? Because he ran out the money changers in the temple. That temple was the largest edifice west of Rome, 400 troops, intellectuals on one side. Elites on the other side and got a ragtag disciple. What we're doing, Jesus, was just watch me. I'm going in here for the poor. I don't hate the rich. I hate greed. I hate indifference. It's the classical conception of Christian hatred, which is you hate to sin and still love the sinner. You hate the injustice and you still stay in contact with the humanity of the person who perpetuates it. Why? Because you yourself will also in moments in your own life be victimizing somebody else, putting somebody else down. Could be patriarchy, could be transphobia, could be homophobia, could be not staying in contact with the humanity of precious Jews or Arabs or Muslims or Palestinians or Ethiopians or Roma or Dalits or anybody else. All of us caught in this matrix of the hounds of hell. Nobody pure, nobody pristine, nobody free of spot or wrinkle. And yet you still decide. This is how I want to live my life from my mama's womb to tomb. Subversive piety. Not uncritical deference, the dogma. Not blind obedience, the doctrine. It is the virtuous acknowledgement of the sources of good in your life of those who helped you in your moment of deep crises. God, it could be mom, it could be granddad, it could be an uncle, it could be a friend we met with the basketball team, with Brother Forbes and those precious brothers. They're going to win tomorrow night. I, I told them I was going to pray, but my prayer is not the most efficacious uh, uh, activity. I've been praying to abolish poverty for the last 60 years. You can see what impact that has had. <laughs> but they're going to win tomorrow night. But the basketball coach, Shaping virtue, shaping the sense of community, getting outside of the narcissism and the hedonism and learn what it's like to be a human being listening to the moves, the voices of others. That to me is the best of what our dear brother Mac Bryan was all about. Let us never ever forget his witness. Let us never, ever forget his work. Thank you so very much.
In the tradition of our people, it is right and holy to give thanks for wisdom when it is poured out from deep soul. Thank you. Thank you. For truth and beauty and love, thank you, thank you, Ashe. Thank you. Dr. West, thank you on behalf of Wake Forest University, especially the School of Divinity and African American Studies. We are truly, truly different than when we first came in. I have the pleasure of serving with Dr. Corey Walker at the Director of African American Studies, Melanie Harris in the School of Divinity, jointly appointed with African American Studies to lead us in just a little bit of Q&A. We've been gifted with the opportunity to see your questions through Minty. So I want to invite you to take a look at the screen and go ahead and follow this link to place your questions there. We also have a few questions that have come in ahead of time, Dr. West, so we'll start there. Dr. West, one of the questions that came up in advance was a question around fear, fear around critical race theory. Parental and public fear of critical race theory was likely a driving force in the recent surprising election in Virginia. How can educators productively promote honest education about race in a way that might overcome the influential power of fearful parents? Well, I'll ask Brother Jonathan to answer that with his vision and courage and analysis. I just want to be a fly on the, on the wall in his classes that I remember at Harvard and Princeton and his magnificent leadership at this divinity school. Love is the most powerful thing that breaks the back of fear, but love takes a number of different forms. It takes a number of different forms. Um, on the one hand, you have to try to get inside of the skin of people and get a sense of why they believe what they believe. Even the most thoroughgoing gangster and thug still has humanity inside of him and still has the potential and possibility to change. And so it's going to be not just argument, it's going to be a certain sense that you care about their situation and then, then push them to show just how unconvincing and uncompelling and sometimes it's downright disgusting, their perception and their practices. Now, anybody who believes that critical race theory is taking over the curriculum of the state of Virginia <laughs> you say, hmm, well, we need more than a Wednesday night prayer meeting for that, though, don't we? No, what it is that they have been socialized and subsumed by a worldview that black folk are taking over and that no one is listening to them. And so you come back and say, we're listening to you. We just want you to make sense <laughs> when you raise your voice. Oh, yeah. It's true. 
I mean, a white, America is not reducible to white supremacy. Whiteness itself is not reducible to white supremacy. I mentioned John Brown. There's a whole, Mac Bryan, there's a whole wave of vanilla brothers and sisters who struggle against white supremacy. They just had tons of cousins who never got the memo. <laughs> so when they met Thanksgiving, sat around the table, Oh, Brother Mac, you must be one of those in lovers. You invite Martin Luther King Jr., James Cone. No, I'm a follower of a Palestinian Jew named Jesus. No, no, you want those black folk to take over. How they gonna take over? You got them sharecropping, you got them tenant farming, you got them in, under surveillance. You, under, you see the mass incarceration, you see the disgusted school system, you see the various white supremacist ideology teaching them to hate themselves, and you think they're going to take over? Yeah, I heard the radio and they just got all the black voices. Well, okay, you got a point. You got a point. <laughs> That's right. The black genius and the black talent cannot be stopped, and it does spill over into the arts in a variety of ways, and one of the reasons why black people are world historical people is because artistically, we have disproportionately shape the sounds of the world and the artistic orientations of the world. That's a fact, that's a fact. That doesn't make us better or worse, it makes us human beings whose genius has been manifested in that way. So you just try to have some patience with folks and say, well, let's just get to the source of your fear. Now, we know in the end you're gonna have to have movements, you're gonna have to have organizations. You have to bring power and pressure to bear. And you have to have human beings who have integrity, who are part of those movements. I've never been impressed by quantity. I used to get invited to these big mega churches. And they come in, 15,000 for, oh, Brother West, look at us. We spread the word. I step up. I said, oh, we got a mega church. Now, do we have mega love and mega courage up in here? Or is this just another commodified site where you turn the blood of the cross in the Kool-Aid? Where people just dip in in order to get access to their blessing in the form of control of a commodity so you can feel good about yourself? That ain't got nothing to do with the gospel, but it's mainstream American business practice. And I would just try to say it with love, you know, because people change. People get tired of the prosperity gospel. They run up against the wall. I've been at Liberty University with my, my, my Christian brothers and sisters. Well, we had a time there. Me and Brother Robbie Joe, we had a time. We stayed for two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. And what happens? That was years ago. Now I run into the same one. You know, Brother West, I, my God, you were making more sense than I thought 10 years ago. I, I, ooh, I, I, you started talking about poverty, and now I'm working with William Barber and Sister Thea Harris. I said, Jesus be with you. Same, as, same with black folk. You know, you were so hard on Obama when you talked about dropping drones in, in Somalia and Pakistan because you said Jesus loved the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black or white. They are precious in his sight. So a baby in Somalia has the same status as a vanilla baby in Winston-Salem and a chocolate baby in Raleigh. That's right. That's my fundamentalist Christian faith sanctity and dignity in the Imago day. So any president dropping drum, I'm going to be critical. It could be Bush, it could be Obama, it could be Trump. I don't care what color they are. It's a moral and spiritual witness. And if you see me dropping bombs, slap me upside the head rhetorically. <laughs> slap me upside. I wouldn't do it because Anahita would have beat you to it. Because she loves me. Brother Jonathan would have called me on the phone and said, Brother Wes, uh, I love you much, Brother Lee. Let's have, let's have prayer. I heard you dropping drones on folk. I, I, I know you. I know you. I know you well. It's not, it's not the best of you. And, but let's just pray on it. So I, I, I love that. <laughs> I'm just cutting up up here. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor West, um, you spoke about the courage to tell truth, uh, the virtue of aspiring to truth. Yes. In a moment when our society 
is saturated with so many untruths through our media, our public discourse, our politics, and our popular practices. How do we as a country overcome this abundance of untruths in initiating a new regime of truth? Mm. Oh, I appreciate that question, Brother Cole. I mean, one thing to keep in mind, we don't want to fetishize the present, which is to say, to ascribe magical powers to certain processes in the present as if these things have not been operative in a massive way in the past. Do you think if we went back to Wake Forest University 75 years ago, that we wouldn't have to deal with what Du Bois called fear of the truth and the efficacy of lies and praxis, that wonderful essay of his in the souls of white folk. That's the 1920, you all know souls of black folk, 1903, souls of white folk. Any moment in the history of the species, you'll see the hounds of hell, the lies, the crimes, the hatred, the fear. With modern technology, digitized communication and so forth, it's thrown in our faces. It's, just, it's thrown in our faces. But my hunch is that anybody of an old age, if I'm old school and somebody's old, old school, I could just hand the microphone to them. They tell you about the lies and the crimes and the mendacity and the criminality and so forth. It's always been there, y'all. It's always been. And the last thing we want to tell our young people is somehow, you live in more in a moment of lies than grandmama did. No, no, that's not true. You just have a different hyper market driven mode of communicating it, you see. But in the end, this is a wonderful line from Emmanuel Kant in the Critique of Pure Reason. He says, examples are the go-kart of judgment. Examples. You have to have people who exemplify the integrity, honesty, decency, love, justice, and so forth. And if your cloud of witness gets thin and weak, then you lose your democracy. You're on to fascism. And fascism is simply the rule of big business, big money, with xenophobia as the public face of white supremacy and male supremacy and the hatred of Jews and Arabs and Muslims and indigenous peoples and Spanish speaking peoples, but behind the scene, we saw it with a gangster named Hitler. He never could have survived if he didn't have the economic elites behind him and the political elites behind him and the professors and the pastors. Thank God for Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You all know the great Bonhoeffer. He tried to kill Hitler in the name of Jesus as a Lutheran. Now, I'm Baptist, so I'm left wing of the Reformation. I'm way out with the Quakers and the Mennonites. That's my crowd. But he's a Lutheran, the two kingdom doctrine, always succumb to the powers that be. He said, no, no. But he was almost by himself, and he's executed April 9th, 1945. Even the confessing church did it to purify the gospel, not to be in solidarity with the Jewish brothers and sisters. That, that wasn't Christian love. Christian love was not purifying the gospel. What you do to the least of these you do unto me, somewhere I read, that's what the Bible says. And so when we talk about the ways in which these lies are pervasive, we just need more voices, we need more figures, we need more movements, institutions, structures who raise their voices unequivocally and not simply out of narrow interests. You raise your voice because you believe is right, is moral, is just, and if you are a Christian, it's like Walter Hawkins, what is this inside of me? If I don't say something, the rocks are going to cry out. I can't hold my peace. Something's inside of me pushing me, shoving me to bear witness. You might die. So what? That's all they can do is kill your body, please. 
you're going to die anyway. Use your death for the kingdom. People come up to me all the time, Brother West, Brother West, what's your brand? I ain't got no brand, I got a cause. Kingdom of God ain't no brand. Freedom struggle's not a brand. That's a niche in the market. We talking about lives live for something bigger than them. But our young folk these days have been dealing with the most commodified, market-driven culture in the history of the world. There's no doubt about that. So non-market values like love and justice and trust are very weak and feeble. And that's part of the pessimism, that's part of Afro-pessimism, that's part of the nihilism, that's part of the despair, that's part of the overwhelming uh, 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 depression that is setting in among a lot of our precious young folk. They no longer have what Ephesians 6 was talking about in terms of the armor. Their armor is too thin, it's too weak. You see, you can see it in the music. You see, it's music these days is almost a spiritual war against young people because the music's not soulful. And soulful is a sharing of a soothing sweetness against the backdrop of a grim catastrophe that allows you to keep on keeping on and keep on pushing the way Curtis Mayfield talked about it. And once you no longer have an armor, when you're hit, your first response is, I'm woke. Hey, that's good. <laughs> then I see him two weeks later, I'm still work, woke. Get some sleep, you're going to suffer from insomnia. <laughs> We're not talking about woke only. We're talking about fortifying yourself with a spiritual, intellectual, and moral armor that you part of what the war for truth and goodness and beauty is all about. This ain't no lifestyle for a few years before you make your move back into your career careerism and opportunism. We talking about a life lived, sacrifices made, solidarities with people all around the world ready to die. Oh, Brother West, you going that far? That's what Martin Luther King Jr. told the young folk in Birmingham, didn't he? What did he say? Show up tomorrow in your cemetery clothes. Because that's what these police will do. That's what Bull O'Connor will do. And they did show up. And they went to jail by the thousands in, in Birmingham. Is that right, my distance? Thousands. You know what kind of armor that requires? Malcolm hated it, didn't he? Malcolm said, Martin Luther King Jr., Brother Brandon's writing the brilliant book on Malcolm, you ought to be ashamed of yourself to have all these precious black children in the front, in the face of these police going to crush them. Where's the adults? What kind of armor they got? Are they willing to die? And Martin said, well, you know, he said to himself, Malcolm got a point here. It's a major responsibility to have these children out here. Some of them can get killed immediately, you see. But the crucial thing was, and this is what Malcolm missed, and keep in mind, Malcolm said that on 125th Street and 7th Avenue in Harlem, <laughs> whereas Martin's right there in gut bucket American apartheid, barbarism. He could have got shot and killed any second. It's different context to keep in mind. But the crucial thing is we can learn something from Malcolm. How do we make sure all of us are armored in such a way that we can stay on the straight and narrow road or stay on the caravan of love of the Isley brothers or the love train of the OJs? How do you stay on that tr love train? How do you stay on the justice train? You can't do it by yourself. You've got to have friends, comrades, family members, visionary and courageous citizens who are there to help keep you accountable. That's the key thing. And that's what makes it so beautiful. When I, when I talked to Brother George, he was talking about the impact that, uh, that Mac had on him. And I said, he was, he was your teacher. He said, well, no, he's more than a teacher. Let's get this straight. He was my mentor. You know what a mentor means? And this is so true for young folk, because I run into a lot of young people these days. So-and-so is my role model. How are they going to be your role model? They don't even know you. 
Well, I saw him on television. Uh-oh. He got spectacle. He said, he's my mentor. I could touch him. Talk at night. Argue. Wrestle. Allow me to acknowledge that I'm not the crazy one in a context of 1960 and Wake Forest where we are embracing Martin Luther King Jr. and a whole lot of our folk think we have lost our cotton-picking minds. Is that right, Brother George? Just trying to tell the truth, my brother. That's exactly right. No, that's a mentor. That's somebody you can hug, somebody you can touch, somebody you can talk to, somebody you can wrestle with. Very different than role models. Role models are market model. One peacock imitating another. No, but a mentor. Right there. In the funk, in the mess, in time, in space, in history, in your life. Anybody call their mama a role model they need to undergo some serious transformation. No, no. No, no, I hope you had the real thing the way I had the real thing. That love was as real as a heart attack. That's what we're talking about in terms of examples. It's hard to find that these days. Just like it's hard to find it in the music. I tell the young folk all the time, I noticed that you all, uh, you've given up on soulfulness. You have no groups like the Delphonics and the Dramatics and Enchantment and the Temptations and the Jones girls and the emotions and the miracles and the whispers. You don't believe in that silky soul because you no longer really even understand what music is in connection to tenderness. So Otis Redden said, try a little tenderness. The baby face wrote a song about Roni and said she was a tender Roni. <laughs> oh yes. And what did Toni Morrison say when she stepped up to gave the eulogy for James Ball? And I was sitting right on the left, St. John's Church in New York. We, we walk by it every day, don't we, Dobe? 1987. She said, I, I lived in his language. He exemplified courage, but most importantly was his tenderness. See, part of the greatness of black people has been the ways in which in the face of the most vicious barbarism, there is a gentleness and tenderness. David Ruffin's tenderness in his voice. Russell Tompkins Jr. of the stylistics and Ted Mills of Blue Magic. Oh, all of that delicacy in the face of all of that social misery. Where do you get that? Ella, Sarah, Billy, Johnny Eck, Johnny Hartman. Where do you get this tenderness from? It means that white supremacy and its ugliness has not had the last word. And we pass it on that tenderness to our children. And it might not be visible under the white gaze. Let the white gaze go. White fears and insecurities and anxieties don't sit at the center of the universe. No. It's a slice of humanity. You got a whole lot of other folk out there. It's like the great Faulkner. We love Faulkner and his genius on the vanilla side of Mississippi, but he could never understand the relations of black people with each other. He could only understand black folk in relation to him. Period. Delcy. Well, we won't go into sound and fury, but you all know what I'm talking about. Joseph Conrad's the same way in Heart of Darkness. He can't understand the relation of Africans with each other. He don't even care. It's just the white normative gaze that he has. He has a right to his gaze. Everybody got a splinter in the eye. That's the biggest magnifying glass. That's why we need all of our eyes and ears together to help us see what we're missing. The great Henry James wrote a letter to Robert Louis Stevenson, January 12, 1901. And he said to Robert, he said, no theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. No philosophy, no religion, 
no tradition is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. And what we learn at Shiloh, we want you all to see Jesus more clearly with all of the love. And to follow Jesus more nearly, needing all of the faith and hope and love. And then to love Jesus more dearly. Seeing, feeling, and then acting. That's a human thing. And all of those levels and dimensions are required in order to keep alive the best of the prophetic tradition. I know that was a long response. I'm sorry to go on, but I appreciate the questions. We have truly experienced an event this afternoon in Wake Chapel. With deep love and gracious humility, Professor West has truly challenged us with a bold, embracing message that calls us to a life of hope-filled struggle to create a truly humane world. Indeed, his message and the McBride, his message and the McBrien Prophetic Speaker Series uniquely exemplify the essence of our university motto, Pro Humanitate. This year and throughout 2022, the program in African American Studies will mark the significant publication anniversaries of major texts in the discipline. I invite you to join us tomorrow as we commence this endeavor with a symposium marking the 40th anniversary of Professor West's groundbreaking text, Prophecy, Deliverance, and Afro-American Revolutionary Christianity. Additional symposia will mark the 70th anniversary of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man in February 2022, the 40th anniversary of All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave, edited by Gloria T. Hall, Patricia Bell Scott, and Barbara Smith in April 2022, and the 70th anniversary of Frantz Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks in the fall of 2022. Tomorrow's symposium on Professor West's groundbreaking text will be held in the Broyhill Auditorium in Farrell Hall beginning at 10 a.m and will feature Professor West joined by Vanderbilt University Professor Shatima Threadcraft, Harvard University Professor Brandon Terry, University of California Riverside Professor Maisa Cherry, along with Dean Walton and myself as we begin a conversation that is a truly an event on the publication of his text. Thank you again, Professor West. Thank you to my teacher. Thank you to my brother. Thank you to the entire community at the Wake Forest University Divinity School, our partners at university events, faculty and students in the program of African American Studies. But most importantly, we want to thank each and every one of you for making this day truly a very special day in the history of our university. Thank you and good evening.